Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the intro, Ramses. Uh, hopefully, the the droning in the background quietens uh, throughout the talk. There's some work going on uh, at the Mars building in Toronto right now. Um, but today, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we went through the process of uh, getting the re refresh for Niagara and MIST uh, supercomputer. So I'm just going to give a, an overlay. So I'm going to start by giving a motivation of why um, why I'm giving the talk and the considerations that we took uh, to get the the refresh for Niagara. And then I'm going to go on to some performance metrics that can be used to uh, analyze the uh, a system the system performance. And then I'll describe this SSI metric that we went with eventually. And then I'll go through the list of benchmark applications that we used um, for the new systems. Uh, and then finally, I'll look at the, the file system performance uh, and then I'll go and summarize everything. Okay. So deciding on a new HP system, HPC system, can be can be a very difficult decision to make because we need to suit the the needs of our users and make sure that their applications their codes run on uh, run uh, very efficiently on the new system but then we also need to take into a whole other set of considerations so it's not it's not an easy decision to make. So I'm just going to go through uh, the questions that we need to ask. So how do we choose the hardware? Do we go with uh, AMD as a CPU uh, or even a GPU? Do we use Intel, NVIDIA? And this is on the, uh, the compute node side of things. So this is the CPU, GPU. But then also you've got to consider the the file system storage. So do we go with uh, DDN as a vendor or we have uh, a new uh, player on the market called VAS, which is another option. We need to make these just types of decisions. And then, okay, what file system should we use? Should we go with uh, GPFS, GPFS uh, Lustre, again, VAST? But then what should the, the total storage of this be? What can we afford within our budget? Uh, how many petabytes can we get? Also, how do we measure the performance of the file system? Do we set a, a minimum bandwidth on the performance that it should meet uh, in order for the proposed system to be chosen? And then there's another question of CPU versus GPU nodes. Do we want all CPU nodes? But we know that not all applications run efficiently on a CPU. Sorry, not all applications run efficiently on a GPU. So do we want a combination of both CPU nodes and GPU nodes? Okay, if we have a combination, what ratio then? Do we want 50-50, 80-20? Uh, and depending on this ratio, it depends how big the system can be based on a given budget, a monetary value. So th these, this is a quite a hard uh, number to come up with. Uh, and again, based on that is how many total nodes do we want? Because we could say get a large number of nodes uh, of only CPU nodes uh, but they wouldn't contain GPU nodes, so we could get more more of them. The same goes if we go for a say a lower end CPU versus the higher end CPUs. We could increase the the, the total number of nodes, but per CPU would be lower in performance. Or do we want fewer numbers of nodes with better CPUs? Then we move on to the interconnect. So this is how all the nodes talk to each other. How do we want that to be implemented? Do we want to use uh, InfiniBand, 
which is an option out there, but there's also sling, Slingshot. Again, the question is, what's the best performance? But then also, what topology do we use? Do we use uh, Dragonfly Plus? Do we use uh, Factory? These are all other considerations when we're talking about the, the network. Perhaps one of the, the biggest uh, constraints is our power budget. So uh, at our current data center uh, for Niagara, I think we have power budget of two megawatts. So will the new system fit within that power envelope? Um, based on all of the total number of nodes, we need to factor all of this in into the power budget because this is one of the biggest uh, limiting factors. Then the other question is, will it fit in our current data center? So we're talking now about pure square footage. Uh, will the racks fit in, in what we currently have? So then do we need to find a new data center or can we use it in the, the, uh, the current one we have? That's another question we need to ask. And then we move on to cooling. So how do we how do we cool the cluster? So currently we have fans. Do we stick with fans? If if we stick with fans, a large a large fraction of the power budget is based on cooling the system. If we don't go with fans and we go with liquid cooled, we can use more of the power budget for compute versus cooling. So we can also balance that aspect as well. And then another question is, okay, we go with liquid cooled. Do we go with direct liquid cooled? This is when each component has is, is cooled individually, or do we go with this, the other technologies available so we can have immersion. So this is when we have the racks sort of horizontally instead of vertically and they're sort of like in a bath and we can slide the the compute nodes into the bath where they're all fully submerged. But then this leads to other concerns of maintenance. Uh, it makes it much harder to maintain the system. And then again, if we go with direct liquid cool, there are options to partially cool the node. So we would only cool, say, the CPU and the GPU, but you can also cool the, the RAM as well, the memory dims, and even the power supply. So then it then becomes a question of what fraction of the total node do you want to liquid cool, the 100%? Again, this is all based on the budget and what we want to achieve. So that, yeah, so then the next big question is what budget do we have to work with uh, and what size of system we want to get and the technology. And then the next big thing is we have a given budget We'll spend that on, on the cluster, but then we also need to factor in how much it's gonna cost power-wise to run the system daily, yearly. That has to be also factored in to the budget. So yeah, how do we balance all of the above constraints and purchase the best possible system for our users? That's, that's the big question. And how are we gonna achieve that? And then the next one is given a set of vendors who will propose new potential systems, how do we decide? How do we pick between each vendor or each potential system uh, based on a performance metric? Which one do we use? So we can rank them in order of preference. Okay, so the first thing is we need to come up with a, a performance metric. So we can quantify how well the system performs. Now, we can get a single performance metric that evaluates all aspects of the system, which we can be used to rank each potential system is, is what we're looking for. So sure that there are performance metrics out there that measure raw throughput 
um, of the system. So for example, the high performance lint pack uh, benchmark HPL, which solves a, a random dense linear system in double precision. It measures the, the total flops. So this is the total number of 14 point operations uh, per, sec per second that the, the system can achieve. And this is what's used to rank HPC systems on the, the top 500 list. But this is a good metric for raw performance, not necessarily what we are, we are looking for when we uh, try to get our, our new system. Yeah, so it's not representative of the vast majority of workloads that run on our system. Not every system is solving a dense linear system in, in double precision. So we need to come up with a, a, a better metric that suits our purposes. The, the other issue is as uh, newer generations of systems are becoming available, they're becoming more and more heterogeneous. And what I mean by that is the types of nodes are becoming so these we have cpus but then we also have gpus now uh and it becomes harder to uh, combine the performance of both together and we run into the problem as i touched on earlier is every application will not necessarily run on each node type but even if they do run on each node type they might not perform the same or better on the new node types. So for example, on Niagara, which is a purely CPU system, and we have MIST, which is a GPU system, we have 2,024 CPU nodes on Niagara and 54 GPU nodes on MIST. So we need to come up with a metric that A, represents common workloads that run on our system, and B, combines the performance of each node type that makes up our system into one, one number, one score. So it just so happens that the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, NERSC, has developed such a metric as they go through what's called the RFP process uh, every couple of years to ask for bids on their new systems. They've developed a metric called the scalable system improvement metric. And it's just outlined here. This is the equation for it. Uh, where it's made up of U, which is the which is known as the utilization factor. Then we have S, which is the speed up factor. And then W, which is the, the benchmark weight. So I in this case refers to each benchmark application, so you'll, so you'll get a series of um, values for each of these terms for each benchmark. And then what we want to do is compute the, the mean over all benchmarks so that we get one, one number at the end of things. So this is how we combine the benchmark scores. Yeah. So I'm gonna go through uh, each, each term in the equation uh, in, in a little bit more detail. But if there are any questions uh, before I continue. I don't think so. Okay, thanks, Ramses. Okay, so we have the, the utilization factor. This is the first term. So this is just defined as, as this, where each, so N is the, the total number of nodes in the system and n is the total number of nodes used in the in the benchmark uh, application again i refers to each benchmark and ref refers to the reference machine so in our case this was niagara so what we did is we ran each benchmark on niagara is so as like a baseline to compare all of the the newer systems and their performance so what this term is doing is it's sort of the machine utilization. So it was introduced to reward application throughput. 
and SIP system size relative to the reference system. So in other words, if the proposed system can run the same benchmark that was run on Niagara on a smaller fraction of the total node, the total system, compared to the reference, it will score higher. So say it takes, I don't know, say it takes 100 nodes on Niagara to run the benchmark based on um, memory requirements. You need that many nodes. But if you run it on the the new proposed system on 50 nodes, then it will score higher, given that that fraction is is uh, is met here. Given it, yeah, given it that the, the, it's a smaller fraction of the total number of nodes in the system. And then we have the next term, which is called the, the speed of factor. So this is, you just take the, the total runtime of the benchmark or any other figure of merit, uh, such as time per iteration. So this could be a rate also. Um, so mainly it's gonna be time to solution or some codes give you, yeah, flops again or, well, yeah, the dynamics codes give you nanoseconds per day. This will give you the, the total speed up. Again, ref is just the reference machine for Niagara, and I is each benchmark application. But yeah, it's much simpler. It's just the, yeah, the speed up of the benchmark running on the newer system compared to the reference system. With the idea that the newer system is going to improve on the time to solution. So that's going to lower the time to solution. And then in the case of the rates, it's going to uh, increase. So this, I think this, this equation inverts depending on which, uh, which metric you choose to use, which T you choose to use. Because for rates, higher is better, but for seconds, lower is better. So this constraint is necessary because, for example, you could just maximize U, so this is the utilization factor, by running the bench benchmarks on the fewest number of nodes to avoid scale ineff inefficiency. So what you could do is you could create uh, what are known as fat nodes, so you could load a lot of memory into each compute node and run the benchmarks on, on the fewer nodes, and then you don't run into inefficiencies either over the network yeah, so this could lead to a system that sacrifices the the network performance for an increased memory per node. So you would you would be able to run your problems on much fewer nodes because it would fit in RAM. Um, but then Niagara is a large parallel system, so we want jobs to run on uh, hundreds uh, up to uh, the total. I think we have two thousand nodes right now. We want to run a large number of nodes. So we want to make sure that the the network performance is also encompassed in these uh, this performance metric. So that's why this this factor is in here to balance the, the utilization factor. And then we come on to the weights. So what you can do is you you can pri prioritize um, some benchmarks over others by setting these weight values in between uh, zero and one. <clears throat> so say a benchmark uh, represents a, a larger fraction of the workloads that are being performed on your system, then you would weight it higher than another benchmark, which has a, a lower number of uh, jobs running on the system. Yeah, so you can just you can fine tune these values, just to increase the reliance of the score on that particular benchmark. So I don't know, say for example, your system has high uh, fraction of molecular dynamics codes, then you can increase the weight of this uh, value here on the be the molecular dynamics benchmark, and then it'll be weighted higher in the, the SSI score. 
Now we come on to the mean calculation. So we have to decide on how we compute the mean because there's a few different cases that we can choose from. So we have the arithmetic mean. Now this is typically used when the performance metrics are in units of time. So seconds, for example. Then we have the harmonic mean, which is used when a rate is used. So this is floating point operations per second. But then we have the geometric mean, which is best used for when we're normalizing against a specific baseline. So you might have guessed, so we're doing it against uh, Niagara as a baseline for, for normalization. Um, so we, we went with the, the geometric mean because we're normalizing against Niagara. And then this is just the, the, the computation of the, uh, the geometric mean. So we just take the product of each uh, benchmark, so of each, um, so when we compute the SSI score, we just take the product of them and then we take the root uh, where N is the, the number of benchmarks to run. So for, for Niagara, we equally weighted all benchmarks. So we set them all to one. So that didn't factor into the equation. So the final form of the equation is just the, the utilization factor multiplied by the speed factor here, all taken over a, a geometric mean. Are there any questions so far about that, uh, that performance metric? Okay, I'll continue. So we've we've introduced the SSI score, but we need to choose a set of benchmarks such that they represent um, our system, or what's currently running on Niagara. So what we did is we can we looked at the the current workloads that are running on Niagara and MIST, and we came up with a list of the top the top jobs, and we found that. Uh, matrix uh, slash linear algebra was one of the top ones. And then computational field fluid dynamics. Then quantum chemistry. So this is the, the density functional theory codes. Uh, then molecular dynamics, which is another big one. And then atmospheric research. So this is weather forecasting. And then on MIST, the top workloads were uh, molecular dynamics and machine learning. So what we want to do is create a benchmark suite such that it ha includes, at the very least, each of these types of applications. So that we get a representative score, uh, SSI score. So based on that list, which was the following benchmark applications. So we have uh, HPCG, which is high performance conjugate gradient uh, code. It is sort of similar to, to HPL, where they use it to uh, measure the, the total performance of systems. Um, and then we chose NECRS, which is a, a CFT code. And then quantum espresso for the, the quantum chemistry uh, codes, uh, which stands for open open source package for research and electronic structure simulation and optimization. And then we have NAMD, which is the molecular dynamics code, which scales very well. Then we have WARF, which is the, the weather uh, research and forecasting model so that checks that of the list of applications. And then we have Spec HPC, uh, which is a, a company that creates benchmarks uh, to uh, evaluate the performance of the systems uh, in general. So it's sort of like a, a mini mini benchmark. I'll, I'm going to move on to each particular benchmark in detail 
uh, next. And then we have Gromax. So we, we decided to choose a, uh, so the, the code that was running on Mist the most was Gromax and it was running uh, specifically on the GPU. So this is a Groningen uh, machine for chemical simulations. And then we chose uh, MLPerf, which is a benchmark for uh, machine learning. Because as we are moving more to AI and machine learning, we will, so they're currently running on this, but I think we'll see in the future more, more and more uh, jobs uh, running machine learning. That's why we picked that one. So we created a full list of benchmarks with the instructions on how to use them, and you can access them here. It's publicly available uh, on GitHub if you're interested. But now I want to go through uh, each application that we chose and just briefly describe it. So we have HPCG, which is a, an open source project um, developed, I don't know, it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago now. Um, it's used quite a lot um, across the world. We've got the source there. Yeah, so this is designed to exercise computational data access patterns that closely match a broad set of important scientific applications. So that I used, um, so it tries to cover all, all bases there. So it includes uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication, vector updates, global dot products, uh, then moves on to gauss seidel smoothers, uh, sparse triangular solvers. And then it's written in C++ with MPI and OpenMP support. So we can scale it up to multiple nodes and utilize in every single core on the node when we create our benchmark. Then we have NECRS, which again is open source. Uh, it's fast and highly scalable uh, CFD solver targeting HPC applications. So it was developed at Argonne National Lab. Uh, and again, the source is here on GitHub. So it simulates um, Navier-Stokes equations uh, with variable time steppers. Uh, uh, what I found interesting about this is it it's written in in C plus plus, but it has support for MPI and it has uh, a backend called Oka, which uh, supports a lot of a lot of uh, different types of nodes and architectures. So we can run it on CUDA, HIP, OpenCL, and we can also just run it in like multi-threaded just on the CPU. So what this means is the benchmark can be compiled on the system and then we can change the backend dynamically at runtime. So on an NVIDIA, on an NVIDIA GPU, the, the CUDA kernel, kernels are generated uh, I think once the first time you run it and then ever after they just use, reuse the same kernels, but then you can run the same thing again on an, an AMD uh, GPU. And then you can just switch between running on the CPU uh, and the GPU uh, dynamically uh, at runtime. That's what's handy about this, this Oka backend. And then we have Quantum Espresso which is a, a suite of open source computer codes for electronic structure calculations and materials modeling at the nanoscale. So it's all based on density functional theory, plane waves and pseudo potentials. We have the source here. It's written in MPI with OpenMP, but there are uh, GPU versions available. So I, I didn't point it, but we chose our uh, benchmarks such that we had a list of CPU benchmarks that we only run on the CPU, and then two at the end, which were Gromax and MLPerf, we only ran on the, the GPU, because that's just what we found from our users on MIST. 
they were the top workloads. So even if these applications can run on the GPU, we chose that they're only run on the CPU as part of the benchmark suite. Uh, so we can use Quantum Espresso for a whole host of applications. I don't uh, admit that I'm a, an expert in, in quantum chemistry, but these are a lot of equations that they, they solve. Um, but yeah, this was one of the, the benchmarks. And then we have NAMD, which is a highly parallel uh, molecular dynamics code designed specifically for HPC simulation of uh, large biomolecular systems. And this is a highly, highly scalable code up to tens of thousands of cores or hundreds of thousands of cores uh, developed at the University of Illinois. It is, it's, you can download the code. You just need to register uh, on the website in order to get the download link. But we are simulating uh, things typically like this, which is the, the satellite tobacco mosaic virus with NAMD. So it's written in sort of their own in-house Charm++ parallel programming model, which is uh, written in C++. Uh, and it has support for GPUs. Um, and you can simulate uh, constant temperature uh, Langevin dynamics and a whole host of electrostatic systems. Uh, but this, this code is very, yeah, it's highly scalable. It's the way they created it. So I ran some of the benchmarks and they ran up to just like 100, 200 nodes, and we're still at uh, nearly 100% parallel efficiency. So it's a very scalable code. So then we're moving on to the, the weather uh, research and forecasting model. This is a next generation uh, weather prediction system designed for atmospheric research and I think day-to-day -day, uh, forecasting for the weather. Again, you can get the, the source here from the website. It's written in Fortran with MPI and OpenMP support, written on multiple nodes, and it's used for meteorolog meteorological uh, studies and re real-time numerical weather prediction. Now, so spec HPC, uh, this corporation, yeah, so it maintains a standardized set of benchmarks and tools to evaluate uh, performance for the next generation of systems. Uh, and they've tried to choose their benchmarks such that they represent uh, HPC sort of across the world. Um, so it's a fair comparison uh, when we look at different systems. And it's it's done across both CPU and GPU. But the one that we chose was the, the large workload benchmark. So the, even within this one benchmark, it has a series of six sort of mini benchmarks and they cover CFD. So that's like similar to NECRS. But the way you run it is you have to run the whole the whole benchmark suite. So anything we haven't had covered in in the rest of the bench, benchmarks, hopefully they are covered in the, the spec HPC side of things. So that was uh, a CFD benchmark. Then we have tea leaf, which is for uh, linear heat conduction equations. Then clover leaf, which is for Euler equations on a Cartesian grid. And then we have uh, 3D solar coronal magnetic field simulation, uh, and then a high performance geometric multigrid for finite volume analysis. And this is based on the uh, adaptive mesh refinement codes. And then again, we have a, a little mini weather code here that mimics the basic dynamics seen in atmospheric weather and climate. So then I'm going to move on to the, the GPU benchmarks we chose. Uh, 
So we have Gromax. This is, again, it's a molecular dynamics uh, simulation. So we can simulate biomolecules, such as proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Um, and it's highly efficient. We can run out multiple CPUs and also GPUs and other specialized hardware. Again, we can get the, the, the open source code here on the website. Yeah. And this was written in C++, again, with MPI and OpenMP support. There are versions out there with uh, GPU support also. And we can simulate uh, energy minimization and molecular dynamics simulations with free energy calculations. What is that? It's a, a various uh, fields such as that it's used in biochemistry, biophysics, and pharmaceutical research and material science. And then we have MLPerf. So this is an industry standard benchmark for measuring performance specifically for machine learning tasks. And it was developed by ML Commons, which is a consort consortium of AI leaders across uh, academia, research labs, and industry. So it's a standard standard benchmark. You can you can get the uh, the source code from here. Okay, so that reaches the end of all the benchmarks. How am I doing for time? Okay, so I have five minutes left and time for questions. So okay, so we've chosen our list of benchmarks, but we we need to make sure the problem sizes that we are running the applications on are sufficiently large so that one, they, they occupy a significant portion of the RAM because if it's only using a few meg uh, on each node, then we're not exercising the memory, the memory bandwidth. So we're not testing that, so that won't be factored into the score. So we need to make sure that that is reasonably uh, populated. And two, that the problem can be scaled to high core counts. So if it can't be scaled up to high core counts, then what will happen is there is not enough compute or computation to go around each of the nodes. Uh, and then what would be limited by is the, the network rather than uh, measuring the compute on the nodes itself. And we need to make, yeah, so we need to make sure that there's sustained computation on each node and we're not bound by the network communication. So what we did was for each benchmark application, we performed a strong scaling test to confirm the scalability of the code. So this is just an example of the one I did for NetRS. So we have the time to solution and the, the number of nodes that we used. So we scaled it up to, to 200 nodes on that problem size. And as you can see, I think even at 200 nodes, it was 65% uh, uh, parallel efficiency. So it's, it's, it's pretty good at uh, scaling up to large numbers of no nodes. So yeah, so, so far we've only talked about the memory, the compute and the network performance, but another key component of the HPC system is the file system performance. If we can't get data to and from the compute nodes, in a timely manner, then the memory compute network performance, that's that's irrelevant. If we can't feed the compute nodes with data to process, then our system's not gonna be very, very good. So the other major component we need to consider is the, the file system. Now we measured the, uh, the performance of the file system by looking at the bandwidth. So this is looking at, um, the gigabytes per second or the IOPS performance, which is the input output operations per second. Now a good code to measure this is the IOR benchmark. Uh, that comes in handy here. So I'm just gonna go through what the IOR benchmark does. Uh, so it's a, 
It stands for interleaved or random, and it's an open source benchmark for testing performance of parallel storage systems. It has a various uh, interfaces and access patterns you can simulate with it. And this is to exercise a file system by reading and writing files, all done in parallel to sort of uh, mimic what an application would do when it's running on, on the compute nodes. So the list of backends that we can simulate is POSIX, MPIIO, HDF5, HDFS, and S3, so it defaults to POSIX. Um, but what essentially it does is it uses the common, uh, common parallel I.O. abstraction backend here, uh, and then it uses MPI for process synchronization. And essentially it just, it writes a lot of files and then it reads a lot of files just to get a sense of the, the read write bandwidth of the system and the number of IOPS. So you can change the way it reads and writes these files. So you can change the block size, uh, which um, tells you how much to write to a file uh, per access. You can change the number of files per process. So you can have uh, multiple file, multiple processes writing to the same file, or we can have, uh, I think this is the maximal case where each process will write its own file, so that might, will maximize the bandwidth. And you can also uh, modify the transfer size, um, segment size, and the memory allocated, because normally when these applications are running, the the RAM is, is heavily utilized, and then we can just sort of mimic that here in with IOR. And we can also change the file access patterns. So instead of just starting at the beginning of the file and writing all the way through, we can set it to different offsets into the file based on which rank is writing into the file. Uh, we can also uh, do random access, which again is there to mimic what a real world application will be doing on the system when it's running. Think. That's all I wanted to see if the file system. So we have okay, about 15 minutes left. Um, I think I'm finished. I just want to summarize what I've talked about so far. So we've looked at the large list of considerations I need going to buying a new supercomputer. So I think I hope that uh, I've described how we've gone about our process. I can't fit everything into uh, this hour session, but I've touched on the, the highlights of the process we went through. Uh, and then I went on to describe the, the SSI metric for measuring this, the new potential supercomputer uh, bids, for the performance. And then I've briefly gone through our benchmark suite, what we use to uh, go through the refresh process of Niagara. And then I've also looked at measuring the, the file system performance, which we also included in our list. Please feel free to ask questions now, or if you have any further questions to email them to support at signet.utron.ca. So I think that's, yeah, that, that's the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Thank you.